number 10, less developed. Back in ancient times, there were so many civilizations around the world who were growing and developing their own customs, tools, and other innovative ideas. Each civilization advanced at their own pace, but when it comes to Mesoamerican civilizations like the Mayans, some have wondered why they weren't as advanced as others from different parts of the world. While the Spaniards, who later colonized many Mesoamerican places, were using guns, the Mayans were still using swords and shields. Many Mesoamerican civilizations never even developed iron tools and stayed using things like stone and obsidian. This is a mystery that has boggled the minds of many researchers. The theory as to why they might not have advanced as much as other civilizations is that it had to do with their environment. To develop a civilization to the level that others around the world had, the advancement of agriculture and animal domestication had to be successful, and because the lands in which the Mayans lived were home to very few native animal and plant species, it made it hard for these people to advance and therefore caused some difficulties for them. At number 9, Body Modification The Mayans, much like other Mesoamerican civilizations, were big on body modification. The modification process often started from birth and continued to be a staple in their society for many years. Some of their body modification practices included skull shaping, where they would use wooden planks to alter the shapes of baby skulls, dental modifications, where they would drill holes into their teeth and insert gems like jade and iron pyrite into them, and even tattoos. They also had a lot of piercings in their culture, from earlobe to nose piercings and even tongue piercings as well. Some of the elite members of society would pierce their tongues with a stingray spine and then pull a thorn freckled or obsidian crusted vine through it. One of the most intense body modifications that they practiced was forcing their kids to become cross-eyed. From a young age, parents would hang beads from their kids' hair across their foreheads so that their kids' eyes would focus on it and over time they would become cross-eyed. This was a sign of beauty because they associated the look with the way a jaguar's eyes looked before they attacked their prey. Now before I carry on talking about these Mayan mysteries, I would first like to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Naming Their Kids these days, there are so many ways to name your spawn. There are baby name books and websites. Every year, there is a trending list of baby names for parents to choose from, and some even just go with family names for their kids. But back in the days of the ancient Mayan civilization, name your kid was a very simple process because it just depended on what day the kid was born. The Mayans had a name for every day of their calendar year, so depending on which day you were evicted from the womb, that's the name that you were assigned. That means that there would have been a lot of people in their city with the same name. For boys born in the Mayan civilization, they were just given the name of the day they were born, but for girls, they had to have the number 9 in front of their given name as a sign of feminine power, which I find pretty interesting. Imagine if that was how we name people these days. Based on the Mayan naming system, how many people do you know that might have been given the same name as you? At number 7, Sacrifices The ancient Mayan people were another society who practiced human sacrifices as part of their religious practices. Already, the notion of sacrificing a member of your society to appease the gods sounds pretty gruesome, but when you learn about some of the details of their sacrificial practices, it gets a little scarier and a little mysterious too. In their religion, they would sacrifice people like prisoners, slaves, or even regular everyday people. They would start by painting the sacrificial person blue, and they were sometimes subjected to torture as well, depending on the context of their sacrifice. Then they would be led up to the top of one of their pyramids, and either be showered with a volley of arrows, or have their heart ripped out through their chest while it was still beating. Talk about heartbreak, right? Yeah? No. Okay. To make things even more gruesome, sometimes the assistant priest at the sacrificial ceremony would then skin the sacrifice and the head priest would then wear the skin and perform a ritual dance. Yeah, it's super gory and definitely something that I'm glad that I won't have to experience. At number 6, Mayan Graffiti. Now here's something really mysterious that I find quite interesting. Turns out that the Mayans did graffiti. Yeah. So next time you're out and you see graffiti in your own city, you can look at that and know that the Mayans did the same thing. The Mayans were obsessed with writing, and so they would write and draw on anything they could, including their own stone walls. Archaeologists have found many etchings in stone in many ancient Mayan cities. These etchings were made by people carving into plaster using stone tools or obsidian, and the graffiti usually depicted things like people, animals, deities, lion carvings, handprints, and other glyphs. At first, when researchers discovered these carvings, they thought that they were made by children who lived in the communities, but after further research, they realized that these markings had more of a purpose rather than just being random drawings. 
No one really knows why they did graffiti, only that it was just there, which really kind of just adds to the mystery of the whole thing. At number five, Mayan creationism. Whether you believe in evolution or creationism, no one really knows for sure how the world began. There are a number of theories from both sides, but again, it's such a huge notion that it's next to impossible to know where everything began. Every culture has their theory, and the Mayans were no exception, and they even came up with their own story for the creation of life. The Mayans believe that the Earth was created in 3114 BCE, and this date coincides with the beginning of the Mayan calendar. According to their mythology, the world was created in four parts. First came the animals, then wet clay, then wood, and then finally humans, which were said to be made out of maize, which is essentially corn. They believe that all of this was created by artisan gods who crafted the earth and the heavens like sculptures. It's a pretty cool story, but again, we will never know if their theory was actually true. At number four, afterlife. For the Mayans, their version of the afterlife was quite intense and complex. They thought of the afterlife as a soul's journey to paradise, but there was also no guarantee that said soul would actually reach eternal peace. First, a person's soul would have to pass through a terrifying underworld that was said to be the home of frightening deities who had names like Bloody Teeth, Flying Scab, and Bloody Claw. Already quite scary, right? Thankfully, not everyone had to endure this terrifying journey to the underworld. Those who were exempt were victims of sacrifice, women who died in childbirth, those killed in warfare, and people who died playing the game Pocketalk, which was their bloodiest sport. So really, you had to earn your death in this culture, otherwise your journey to the afterlife would be brutal. Which makes a lot of sense as to why death and sacrifice were such a huge part of their culture, because no one wanted to die a lame death and have to face bloody teeth and bloody claw in the afterlife. Even though some Mayan souls were believed to have found their way to paradise, they also believed that life was a never ending cycle, going from life to death and back again. So even if you did reach paradise, you might not have stayed there for long before being thrown right back into the circle of life once again. At number three, burial rituals. On the topic of Mayan death beliefs and rituals, we should talk about their mysterious burial rituals as well. For the Mayans, death was a big part of life, and when you were laid to rest, that wasn't the end of your burial ritual. While your soul was passing through either the underworld or paradise, things were still going on with your remains even years after your passing. The Mayans had tombs for their dead, they often wrapped the bodies, placed them in specific positions, and even provided the person with food for the afterlife. But even after their burial, the Mayans would often exhume their loved one's skeletal remains years later and paint them bright red, and this was especially common for key Mayan rulers and officials. But that's not the only way that they practiced ceremonial burials. Sometimes, before being buried, they would cremate the person and the remains would be placed in decorative urns. It all just depended on the person and their level of importance in their society. At number two, currency. Before I get into the ancient Mayan currency, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me what your currency is. I think it's so cool to see how many different types of currency there are around the world, so let me know yours. Now let's get into how Mayans paid for things. They used chocolate as their currency back in their heyday. The cacao bean was a big staple in Mayan culture, and they had been cultivating it for years. It became so important to them that they even created a deity devoted to the bean. They started off using the cacao bean as a food source, creating chocolate beverages and food, but soon the cacao bean evolved in their society, going from being something edible with bartering value to being a legitimate currency. There are ancient Mayan artworks that depict the cacao bean being used as money in their society, and it's just fascinating. Do you think that you would have liked to pay for things in chocolate? If that was a thing, I wouldn't have any money. And finally, at number one, downfall. The biggest mystery that surrounds the ancient Mayan civilization is what the heck happened to them. To this day, no one quite knows for sure what happened to them and how their civilization died off. During the 8th and 9th centuries, the centers of the Mayan southern lowlands started to decline, and they were abandoned not too long afterwards. This decline was coupled with a decline of architectural advancements and construction. There are a few theories to explain what might have happened to the Mayans, like overpopulation, foreign invasion, peasant revolt, or even the collapse of key trade routes. More environmental explanations for the Mayans' decline include environmental disaster, sickness, or even climate change. Some research have even theorized that there was a 200-year drought that might have contributed to the civilization's collapse. 
Right now though, we have no idea. So by far the most mysterious thing that the mines did was disappear. Kicking off the list at number 10, Roanoke Island, North Carolina. Just off the coast of what is now North Carolina, back in August 1587, around 100 English settlers arrived to Roanoke Island. John White, governor of the new colony, had to sail back to England to grab supplies. But while he was away, a naval war broke out between England and Spain, so his commute was delayed eh, just a tad, you know. He got back three years later in 1590 with said supplies. He's like, hey, sorry I'm late, we got some uh, naval war traffic, you know how it is. Upon arrival, however, nobody was there anymore, including his wife, daughter, granddaughter, anybody. Among the 100 or so inhabitants, they all vanished. The only hint as to where they went or what even happened was the words Croatone and Crow carved into a wooden post and CRO on a tree. Now Croatone or Croatoan was the name of the Native American tribe that lived on the island as well. But after looking for evidence, theories, even archeological exploration, experts still can't figure this one out. I've actually been to this island back when I was 16, so this one really creeped me out, not gonna lie. That's why I wanted to start with this one. Number nine, the Mississippians. We'll dial back the calendar to 700 CE. Now at this point, before European colonization, the American Southeast was home to the Mississippians. Their main area was the city called called Cahokia, which is now modern day Collinsville, Illinois. It's not large either, it's just six square miles. Check out this photo of Monk's Mound, a now historic site. We look at ancient Egyptians and our jaws drop at the sight of those pyramids, plus their alignment with the stars, it's all naturally fascinating. Well, Cahokia was once home to pyramids and large wooden structures as well. We're not exactly sure what happened to this 40,000 person civilization, but experts guess famine and disease. Number eight, Catahuyuk. Another ancient city, another ancient mystery. This time we're looking at what's currently South Central Turkey. About 9,000 years ago, it looked a lot different. Katalhuyuk was popping off until 7,000 years ago, but again, we have no clue what really happened. The most interesting tidbit of history here is the way that this ancient civilization built their homes. They made houses side by side, really close together, and as fitting as it is for this channel, you would say it was almost like a hive-like system. They didn't have doors, they didn't have mail slots or welcome mats. Instead, they had holes on their roofs. That's how they got in and out every day. So yeah, they would use ladders to get in and out, which I gotta say, sounds pretty exhausting. They're probably all pretty ripped. Number seven, Mayans. One of the most advanced civilizations on this list, the Maya, were somehow able to create these massive stone structures in the middle of southern Mexico jungles. Next to the Egyptian pyramids, I'd say these are almost just as popular at this point. One of the most interesting pieces of the Maya, I'm sure as we all recall, was their calendar and the way that they worked it. I mean, we made a movie about 2012. The news was talking about 2012. Literally 12 years after Y2K, we're like, what if it happens again? Like, you know, this time seems serious. It's, it's not, it's not gonna happen. We're good for now. We're gonna probably end ourselves before a calendar or you know, a movie does. The Yucatan jungles are filled with pyramids and beautiful complex monuments lost in time, but where did the builders go and why did they leave? Well, a couple scientists analyzed rock samples around these areas and they were able to study the water levels in nearby lakes, suggesting that the reason the Mayans disappeared were not aliens, but rather they collapsed because of a drought. That checks out. Aliens are cool, you know, and the calendar stuff's cool, but no, nah, they're just drought. Number six, Gobekli Tepe. Just six miles from the ancient Turkey city, Yurfa, Gobekli Tepe is 100,000 years old. They are these massive stone circles created by a civilization that predates Stonehenge by 6,000 years. Yeah, it's nuts. We're convinced it's the world's oldest temple, a holy temple rather, because this area in the world, I mean, now it may not be a spectacle, but thousands of years ago, you would be able to see the horizon in every single direction. Herds of beautiful animals racing by, fields of barley and wheat, it would have looked like a temple from Legend of Zelda. Masterpiece. It was actually first discovered back in the 1960s by university anthropologists. They were doing a survey of the region, found this place, and assumed it was an ancient cemetery and then nothing more, and then continued on their merry way. Now cut to 1994, best year ever. Klaus Schmidt was doing surveys for himself, found the same site, and knew right away from the first glance that this was man-made and there was much, much more to it. Number five, Clovis. We're taking a look at some mammoth hunters for this next point. This civilization is considered the first inhabitants of the new world. Hunters would use what's called Clovis points to get their next meal. They would use chipped flint. Now they had to hunt bison, mammoths, deer, anything that had skin to use for shelter, but also clothing. In fact, this 10,000 year old civilization may have disappeared at the same time as mammoths. After all, with these historical beasts acting as both your gear and your food, the Ice Age ought to do some damage. Number four, 
Anasazi. Before the first skyscrapers were built in the 1800s, the Anasazi built massive stone buildings as well on the sides of cliffs back in the 12th century. Some of these walls, by the way, housed up to hundreds of residents. They were huge. What's now present day Massa Verde National Park was pretty intense back in those days. Scientists have uncovered some hints as to where these creative cliff builders disappeared to. Well, violence. Yeah, the thing that's still going strong today, thousands of years later, see back in the 12th century United States, long term drought led the Anasazi to violence and perhaps they just wiped each other out. Other theories suggest that the Anasazi had to abandon their massive homes around the 1300s and then travel south. Either or. Number three, Easter Islanders. Back between 300 and 1200 AD, Polynesians used canoes, not carnival cruise ships, but canoes, like little canoes, and then somehow traveled all the way to Easter Island over 2,000 miles away from Chile. That feat in itself is impressive. When you start to really think about the Easter Island heads on that island, it gets even more impressive. The Easter Island Moai statues, keep in mind there were hundreds of them at one point, reached up to 32 feet high and weighed over 82 tons. It was a sight to see until the 1800s, because that's when the civilization vanished. But what happened? Well, many of these statues were destroyed during this time as well, so history doesn't really tell us much. The population was decreased drastically, and the island higher ups, be it priests or chiefs, were all overthrown. Well, what happened to them may give us some ideas for the future. See, Easter Islanders cut down so many trees that before those seeds could enter the earth again, rats ate them all. These guys ran out of trees, which means they ran out of rope or the ability to make more canoes. So naturally, a civil war began, everyone was freaking out, plus starvation. Also, plus, plus, plus the arrival of Europeans in 1722. They immediately wiped out most of the remaining Easter Islanders. Then around the 1800s, waves of smallpox reduced the amount of island natives to just 100. Number two, Vikings. I'm a big Assassin's Creed fan, and when they announced Vikings as their newest installment, I was so excited. I'm a big Norse mythology fan, but what actually happened to Greenland Vikings? There's a huge mystery around them. Well, around 985 AD, Eric the Red arrived with large fleet to colonize the island, and of course was subsequently banished for manslaughter. Yeah. So now we have two colonies on Greenland, a large eastern colony and a smaller western one. Now these Vikings didn't build massive pyramids, but instead they built stone churches that still stand to this day. These Vikings were around for a few hundred years and at one point in time there were 5,000 Vikings or so. That's incredible. That's a lot of Vikings. But later on in 1721, a missionary expedition arrived and there were not 5,000 Vikings. In fact, there were zero Vikings. Archaeologists did the digging and apparently the western settlement died off around 1400 AD and just decades later the eastern settlement was well simply abandoned. And there's also a handful of family fun movies that hint at what happened to them as well. The Ice Age. Well the small one in the 14th century but still an Ice Age nonetheless. Number one, the Indus River Valley Civilization. What's now modern Pakistan was one of the world's earliest societies. Also referred to as the Harappan Civilization or the Indus were actually quite large. We are talking about Vikings in the thousands, but the Indus reached about 5 million. Aside from the other earliest civilizations, be it Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, they were considered the most extensive. The world's first ever dentist came from the Indus Valley, so thank you. Something way more interesting though than dentist facts is that when compared to Egyptian ancient cultures, the Indus never built any palaces or temples, meaning there were no priests or kings. But we still get to study ancient texts. Those are always fun and confusing. The Indus had a language that we're slowly but surely decoding today. But even so, there's still around 250 to 500 characters that remain a mystery. Number 10, the forbidden toothpaste. If I looked into your bathroom right now, what would I see? Oh, uh, you forgot to flush the toilet. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Seems you've forgotten your own golden rule there. What I was actually looking at was for a flavor of toothpaste that you had. Classic mint, maybe you got cinnamon. Maybe you go for the whole bamboo toothbrush charcoal toothpaste vibe. Hey, I respect it, good on you for making better choices. But bad on the Aztecs for making gross choices. Ever look at some forbidden lemonade and think, hey, Add some salt to this. And now we got ourselves a bona fide toothpaste? Of course you didn't, because you ain't a crazy person. Or at least I hope you're not. But yeah, Aztecs used to brush their teeth with an unholy mixture of golden broth, pee, and salt. Yeah, I. why would you add salt to pee? I, I think it cleans teeth, sure. You just have to borrow an Egyptian breathman after. It's no big deal, it's fine. It's good for your teeth, it's fine. Number nine, high stakes. Any good game of a sport will have you at the edge of your seat and dropping all cheese flavored snacks around you just so you can keep your eyes glued to the screen. 
The Aztecs did not have access to such finger licking good things like Doritos, but what they did have was a sport that was very high stakes, maybe too high actually, as if you didn't win it could very well cost you your life. A game called, here we go, Chris is gonna like me pronouncing this, called Omalazitli. With its 9 pound rubber ball and eye shaped court, players had to pass the ball through a small stone ring. This game was taken very seriously, like ritual serious, and you didn't want to be on the losing side, as it may cost you your head. Yes, even sports events in modern times have gotten violent, sure, but if we started lopping off heads for our losses, well, Tom Brady would have a lot more blood on his hands, wouldn't he? Number 8. Hot Chocolate as a Canadian, I cannot tell you how important the medicinal qualities that are a hot chocolate on a wet cold winter's day. You've been slipping and sliding down a snow hill for hours, and your snow pants are soaking wet. Partially from the snow and also because your dad made you go down the super scary hill and it was too much for you. Don't tell mom. Hot chocolate was important for the Aztecs too, more so just chocolate actually. It was used for a number of things. First off, after the beans have been roasted, they smell amazing, so it most likely went into some perfumes and other lovely smelling things that they used. It was also used as currency, strangely enough, and it was also, also, also used as a ritual drink, except they didn't exactly have sugar, so they used other things, other ingredients like peppers and other unusual flavor enhancers. To, for chocolate, I don't, the pepper. I, I never understood that. People are like, it's hot, like Mexican hot chocolate. It's, it's pepper and chocolate. It's a weird, hot, cho hot spicy chocolate. Not, a, not a fan. Not a fan. Number seven, corn goddess. I like corn just as much as the next guy. Roasted, boiled, and on the cob. Slap some salted butter on that bad boy. Whew, it's time to dig in. Make sure you got the corn on the cob holders, though. The little metal thingies that you'll probably end up stabbing yourself with later. That's just, that's just how it goes. Besides backyard summer barbecues, corn was an important staple of the Aztecs. So important that they had a festival to honor the corn goddess. Which to me is kind of a lame thing to be a god of, but alright, let's run with it. Zilonan festival had the women let their hair loose and green corn placed in it to honor the god, the corn god. A forced female volunteer was dressed as the goddess and after many days of what I'm assuming is eating and worshipping corn, the forced volunteer was sacrificed by the people to once again honor the corn god. You'd think a bowl of corn would do the job, but no, nope, she's got a lust for blood so that means uh, off with the head. Number 6. End Times We all know what ancient civilizations are like with predicting the future, or more specifically, predicting the end times. Mayans thought everything was going to fade to black in 2012. Didn't, did it. Some people really thought this was going to happen. I always thought that Buddy just didn't get around to finishing the thing, but hey, whatever works. Well, if it was real, why didn't the world end? Well, the Aztec answer to that was the new fire ceremony. Another ceremony, why not? Basically, every once in a while, things got a little crazy. It was a time to cleanse, a spring cleaning, if you will. People stopped working, destroyed household items, and at the end of a five day cycle, some priests would take a dude up a volcano and toss him in there like I toss away bad report cards from my mother. All this to prevent the end of the world. Virus, act of God, bad hygiene. Whatever it was, just good old fashioned blanket solution. Nice. Number five, bread and entertainment. Hygiene is health, and health is mental health, and that means after a long day you need entertainment. That's why you came here hopefully. They say that after bread comes entertainment. I feel the same. Where would my generation be if not for the ability to rewatch The Office infinitely? Aztecs have been theatrical killers, sure, but they also had a soft spot for the arts. During their crazy spring cleaning festival to save the world, you may just find the Aztecs enjoying music and poetry. Some of the poetry even survived the downfall of the Aztecs and is around today. I'd recite it, but I would need some help from Chris to help sound things out. I wonder if they had a poem for a stranger that comes from a faraway land to take all our golden riches away. Hmm. Number 4. More than one way to skin a cat. Here I am talking about Aztecs and that means I gotta talk about how bloodthirsty they were. Seriously, it's good they washed their hands because with the amount of blood on them, well I don't have a joke for that, they just kinda got crazy with it. It's estimated that 20,000 people a year perish to sacrifice. That's that's way too many dude, that's, that's wrong. Which if I'm being honest, those numbers probably could have helped you fight off the Spanish when they, they came to take everything. What do I know? Cutting the heart out of people while they were still alive, a lot of heads no longer attached to bodies, and something that's just so heinous. Texas Chainsaw fans rejoice, because the Aztecs loved a good skinning. Just a good old fashioned peel skin off them. Just take it off, George. 
George, take your skin off. I don't know why I'm Jerry Seinfeld skinning somebody, but sure. What do they do with the skins afterward? Do they throw them into the crowd and they cheer it on? Or, Cause that's, that, that's just wrong, man. That's not right. That's wrong, bruv. The chief was so upset by this one that he had nothing to say, actually. The chief is speechless. He's got nothing. Number three, multiple wives. The act of doing the deed in the bedroom can be messy sometimes. It happens, a lot of passion. And keeping that area on your body and in your life clean is important. Or so says my sixth grade health teacher. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. But you gotta think back in the day how sometimes keeping that area fresh it was difficult, especially because we have no self-control and we went a little crazy with it. Take for example that having multiple wives was a status symbol and let me tell you something, they weren't sitting around waiting for the new season of Stranger Things. They were doing as they do on the Discovery Channel. Number two, get your money right. Any good accountant will tell you that treating your portfolio like good hygiene is a good idea. Go for multiple smells or invest in multiple things. Check out what's on the market. Might be a new perfume, maybe a new stock. And while you're at it, dump a huge investment into fart bucks. Okay, well maybe not that accountant, but believe it or not, the Aztecs were great accountants and had good records of pretty much everything, which is unusual because most cultures in Mesoamerica just, just didn't. And with the amount of gold and riches that the Aztecs had accumulated over time, it was kind of necessary. So you can understand that when the Spanish showed up, they were salivating at the sight of all the treasure that did not belong to them because Hernan Cortez was going to take it. Hand it over, you nice smelling weirdos. Number one, wiped out, dude. Through everything the Aztecs went through or did, it all came down to a fever uh, and a cough and many other symptoms, actually. All of their triumphs and losses, all their sacrifices, and all the times they tried to fend off the Spanish. Futile compared to their fight against the sicknesses the Spanish had brought over. Once there was a patient zero, it was pretty much all over. As good as their roots and medical herbs were at healing, ain't nothing gonna cure that black lung. If it can do what it did to a big handsome cowboy, then it can do the same to everyday people. <laughs> Dutch, <laughs> we got the Aztecs sick again, Dutch. <laughs> I got some chocolate though. Hope you like corn in your chocolate, Dutch. <laughs> Number 10, the founding of Tenochtitlan. The Aztecs have a very strict set of rules when it comes to the appeasement of their gods. Just like any job, if the worker isn't happy, uh, work isn't going to be done, or at least it isn't going to be done well. So when a god needs a little encouragement, the Aztecs will appease them with offerings of the highest value, human lives. In many respects, this is pretty cool, but it certainly didn't make them popular with other neighboring civilizations. Uh, for years they were just shoved around until the god Huitzilopochtli told them that he would aid them in finding their new home. All the citizens had to do was just look for a very specific signal, which would determine the land that they would call home. The symbol was an eagle perched on top of a cactus holding a snake in its mouth. And while wandering, lo and behold, a priest saw the signal, and when the people gathered, the cactus expanded until it became an island, and that island was thus dubbed Tenochtitlan, or the place of the prickly pear cactus. Number 9. Huitzilopochtli and his siblings. When the earth goddess Coatlicue was gifted with a child through a ball of hummingbird feathers, which is commonly denoted as the soul of a warrior, her other children, namely Sentzan Witznoa, the 400 stars of the southern sky, and Koyolatsakwi, the goddess of the moon, decided that having a little brother would be more trouble than it was worth. I'm an only child, but my best friends are twins, so I kinda get the picture. As the siblings conspired to kill their mother and brother, Huitzilopochtli burst forth from his mother's womb, armed with a burning snake sword, battle ready and fully grown. I can only hope it was a C-section. Uh, he defended his mother from the 401 siblings, beheading his sister and throwing her body to the earth. Sentzan Witzna fled, and the image is used to explain why the sun, moon, and stars are chasing each other across the sky. Number 8. Tezcalipoca and Quetzalcoatl's Rivalry 
The Aztecs' understanding of the world implies that there have been four times prior to this one that the gods have attempted to make humanity, and four times that the world has ended. Was it some great threat that wiped humanity off the face of the Earth? Well, not exactly. See, the brothers Tetzcalipoca and Quetzalcoatl didn't exactly get along. The first time that Tetzcalipoca ruled the world, Quetzalcoatl destroyed it and then became the ruler of the second world. Uh, the third world was destroyed by Tetzcalipoca hitting Quetzalcoatl just a little bit too hard. Uh, they didn't really get along that great. Number seven. Jeep Totec. One of the coolest things that can come from looking through various cultures' religions is the way in which they represent similar concepts. There are gods of storms, gods of war, and all of these differences between these types of gods can indicate so much about a culture and their values. In the case of Jeep Totec, this was a god that was meant to represent agriculture and the seasons, and uh, ritual flaying, apparently. Uh, yeah. Unlike the other gods of Harvest, Jeep Totec was a bit more given to a grim disposition, wearing a flayed skin which was meant to symbolize the changing of seasons. There is a certain beauty to this, as everything in Aztec culture was connected to human life in one way or another. Jeep Totec's fashion habits are just deeply symbolic in a way that is, well, both rational and kind of metal. Number six. How Quetzalcoatl made humanity for the fifth time. A lot of stories in the Aztec mythos vary in terms of their understanding of events. As a result, what caused the fourth end of the world and the birth of Quetzalcoatl is a little vague, but one story about the creation of the fifth world, our current world, is deeply fascinating. Apparently, Quetzalcoatl went to Mictlan, the underworld, and constructed the fifth humanity from the bones of the other four, using his blood from wounds to his earlobes, calves, tongue, and a uh, uh, YouTube friendly appendage. Number 5. Tetzcalipoca's Challenge Aside from his brotherly rivalry, Tetzcalipoca was a bit of a mischievous little scamp. Stories tell that he would sometimes walk the earth as a skeleton with a beating heart, other times as a headless man streaked with red and white stripes. This terrifying image would wander around at night, seeking warriors who were doing the same. Once he found a warrior, Tetzcalipoca would challenge them to pull his heart from his chest. If they could, he'd promise to reward them with riches and power. Never actually did that though, uh, just kind of like my buddy Dylan, who still owes me that transformer that I lent him back in elementary school. Come on, Dylan. Number four, Huitzilopochtli rips out his nephew's. Back to Huitzilopochtli, uh, with just the best family relationships. See, he had a nephew by the name of Copil. Uh, feeling ashamed for his uncle's behavior, Copil tried to raise an army to capture his uncle. And now they decided to uh, rest on an island one evening, but Huitzilopochtli's spies informed him of his nephew's little scheme. He ordered his priests to go and steal Copil's heart, and under the dead of night they did just that. When asked what to do with it, they were told to bury it on the island where Copel had come to reside. The next morning, the heart had grown into a cactus, fed by Copel's courage and plot twist. That cactus was the cactus that Huitzilopochtli used as a base for the symbol of the prickly cactus, which would lead the Aztecs to Tenochtitlan. Number three, Tezcatlipoca tricks his brother. Back to Tezcatlipoca, you know, this one's a doozy. So Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca just don't get along in any way. Quetzalcoatl is a big honorable warrior, Tezcatlipoca is a little bit of a sleazeball. They're really just oil and water, you feel? Well, Tezcatlipoca had just about enough of his goody two-shoes bro, so one night he managed to get Quetzalcoatl brutally wasted. This caused Quetzalcoatl to go to his sister Quetzalpetli. And, uh, they... Um... Mmm. Anyways, it wasn't great. Waking up the next day, Quetzalcoatl was so ashamed of his behavior that he just had to bolt. One story has him immolating himself on a pyre, his ashes floating into the sky and forming the morning star. The other one has him just kind of sailing away on a raft made out of snakes. 
Mm. Number two, the heart powered sun. I think we could all agree that the sun is pretty important. It's a nice little piece of astral stuff that, you know, just keeps us all alive. In the creation of the fifth world, the gods decided that they were gonna have to make a new one, but they didn't exactly know how to do this. Holding a meeting, they decided that the best way to go about this would be to hold a contest. One of the weakest gods, Nana Huatsun, decided to compete. Painted white and covered in feathers, the dude yeeted himself into a fire with reckless abandon, where a black eagle caught him and carried him into the sky. This was pretty good until Nana Watson realized that he couldn't move. He explained that he'd need their blood and hearts to help him move across the sky. There was a bit of consternation, a few slung arrows, but the gods eventually acquiesced to his demands, which was how the modern day's sun came into being. Number one. Tetskalipoka's Dance of Death. One more Tetskalipoka story, I promise. This dude's hilarious. So, our boy's just chillin', doing god stuff, when a bunch of townspeople tried to kill him. Why? Their, their plan didn't work, and so Tetskalipoka decided to bring them down to the town center and challenge them to a dance, to the beat of a song that he was singing. They obliged, and he kept them dancing, speeding up the beaten tempo until he danced them right off a cliff. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that there is actually a historical precedent for people dancing themselves to death in cases of mass hysteria, so this story might actually be truer than you'd think. Number 10, a market to die for. The housing market in a lot of places right now isn't exactly the greatest. I mean, who doesn't want to pay three grand a month for an apartment the literal size of a closet? You gotta love New York, right? Well, the Aztecs may have had a similar issue. No, not a housing market with unrealistic prices that are being pressured by both internal and external factors, but rather the Aztecs would bury their dead underneath their homes. What? Yes, that's right. Your house could sit on top of grandma. She loves you, you love her, and now you can be close forever. As great as an idea as this sounds, I personally have a few issues with this. All right, one being that if your family members perish because of a disease, I feel like having them in close proximity to you, even though they're underground, is kind of a bad idea. Oh, also, because, you know, there's just bodies living underneath your house. Way too goth for me. I'll stick to my house not having any burial grounds underneath it, thanks. Yeah, no thanks. Number nine, bring us the girl and wipe away the debt, Mr. Do It. There's some really cool cities out there. Rapture, Columbia, Las Vegas. I've never been to Vegas, but honestly, it's my kind of town. All you can eat buffets, gambling, shows, ladies of the evening. Man, what a city. The Aztecs may not have had a city that never sleeps, but they did have a floating city. No, not exactly like in Bioshock, but close enough. The city of Tenochtitlan was built on a lake, and according to legend, an eagle told the tribes of Mexico, that's what Aztecs were, that's what Europeans called them. I don't know why they didn't call them by their name, but okay. To build their great city here, and it was a great city. The largest and most wealthy city in the region. Its power and wealth come from conquering other tribes and tributes. After all, like I say, if you're gonna be that powerful, you gotta break a few eggs to make your omelet. However, it's not all bad, as it was even known for being a very clean at the time, and may have even had its early version of a garbage program with garbage men. Looking at photos of the city, it looks pretty cool actually, so I'll make sure to visit here when, you know, traveling is safe again because of, you know what? Number eight, missing tech tree. If you've ever played Civilization, Age of Empires, or any other RTS game that lets you command armies of thousands and build bases and cities, then you know how important it is to understand each civilization's tech tree. Some are better than others, and some are a little overpowered. I'm looking at you, Greek from Age of Empires 1. Too powerful. With late 90s PC nostalgia set aside, some civs flourish even without access to certain tech. Like the real life Aztecs, for example, who strangely never discovered the wheel or the use of iron. Yeah, that's right. They built an amazing city on the water without what most Europeans at the time would consider essential. This does make sense when you factor in the terrain. Chino Tillon had lots of water, so trading and moving goods via boat was much faster. The region also had a lot of inclines and was somewhat mountainous. And they were a long way off from building tunnels with roads, so the boats They'll have to do it for now. It just makes sense, actually. Number seven, the land of chocolate. When you think of chocolate, you think of Europe, or at least I do. Decadent, creamy, chocolatey goodness, especially Lindor's. Oh, oh baby, I can put a few of those away. 
However, my chocolate loving friends, it wasn't exactly a European invention, as it was the Aztecs who first introduced the sweet treat to Europeans. Chocolate was so important to the Aztecs that for small purchases, cocoa beans were used as currency. Imagine walking into a coffee shop and instead of handing over a crisp dollar bill, you bust out a Milky Way bar and the cashier says, nah, you need a Milky Way and a Krispy Crunch. Ugh, coffee prices cost too many chocolate bars these days. I know it's a lame joke, but sometimes we gotta have some lighthearted fun. There's a lot of nasty stuff in history. Like what happened after the Aztecs showed the Europeans what chocolate was. Just trying to have a little bit of fun. It, it gets worse down the line, trust me. Number six, girl power. I'm happy once again to tell you that some people of the past were not completely awful, no good, rotten men. Because women in the Aztec Empire had more freedoms than the Europeans did. Come on Europe of the past, get with the program. Aztecs are letting women do stuff and they do some other stuff that's pretty messed up. Which I will get to later, like I said. But for the women of the Aztecs, they were allowed to own property, businesses, but more importantly, could inherit wealth from their parents if they were male or female. which. Kind of means women can marry for love, whereas in Europe, marrying a woman is a business decision. Marry a woman and have children with a 20% increase of love and happiness, and 80% I married you because your father has money and my father has land, so let's make an alliance and just go with that. Say, your sister looks kind of nice though. Yeah, I'll stick to my wife who can own stuff and all of our delicious chocolate, thanks. Yeah, that sounds a lot better. Number five, Montezuma. One day the Aztecs were big chillin' as Aztecs were known to do, when all of a sudden, some strange vessels came into view. It was Herman Cortez and the Spanish conquistadors. At first, relations were good, based on the curiosity of each other's civilizations, simply because everything was new. They looked at each other the same way dads look at a new drill and toolkit on Christmas morning. This, however, quickly soured as things became violent, and not the kind of violence that makes your parents not want you to play video games. I mean real violent, as the Spanish in 1520 slaughtered thousands of Aztecs, including religious leaders and the King Montezuma himself. The Spanish claim they did this to prevent the Aztecs from their favorite pastime of human sacrifice. And the Aztecs claim the Spanish were after their goal. We're both right or both wrong. I'm not sure, but what I am sure of is that there was some fighting and it was a big loss of human life. Bad time to be in that city. It's a good thing powerful militaries would never again falsify information to aggressively take what they want, right? Number four, guns, germs, and steel. By this time, it should be no surprise to anyone that Europeans did some naughty things. Bad Europeans, go sit in the naughty corner. You bad. The Aztecs simply didn't stand a chance against an enemy who was years ahead of them in technology. If having steel weapons and armor wasn't enough, the Spanish also had early firearms, which compared to the Aztecs was like having godlike powers. However, for the Aztecs, things were going to get much worse as the enemy that would have the most effect on them wasn't exactly the easiest enemy to fight. An enemy you can't exactly see. No, not ghosts. Nice try though. Germs, cooties, sicknesses. Europeans brought a whole bunch of lovely ones over. It was the Aztecs' first exposure to such. It caused many of them to perish. Basically the plot of War of the Worlds, except no Tom Cruise, and instead of the invaders perishing, it was the defenders. That movie's not great. Number three, accent wall. You probably couldn't tell, but I have a lot of experience with paint. Used to mix it for a living. And honey, I can tell that you've been thinking about redecorating. Repaint the walls with something happier. Bright colors are in, trust me, sweetheart. Aztecs also like to redecorate, but not with paint, but with human skulls. A skull rack of sorts, place to show off all the human sacrifice that the Aztecs had accomplished. I don't know why people of the past did this all the time. I bet you we'll find more creative human decorating in the future. However, I personally prefer bold colors on my walls instead of actual human skulls, but hey, that's just me. Archaeologists in 2017 found 650 skulls in a temple excavation in Mexico. That's, that's just, okay, sure. <laughs> that's normal. Number two. Fava beans. I ate his liver with a side of fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> anyway, that's a bad impression. That impression was okay. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I think my Marlon Brando is better. But anyway, this one is very weird. Aztecs had a lot of gods and they wanted to keep them happy, which I'll get to in the next part. But sometimes it wasn't all bad. Like when they built idols of gods with seeds and honey. Oh man, that's really yummy. I love seeds and honey. Oh, but I forgot an ingredient. Oh yeah, blood. Yep, that's right. Seeds, honey, and blood. Like the worst granola bar ever made. They would break it off and everybody would just come and take a bite. Besides the major risks of consuming other people's blood, I don't know if you guys have ever tasted blood, but it's somewhere between gross and drinking liquid iron. The Aztecs were also known to practice cannibalism because of reasons, uh, that's why. I get, a little, I get a little lightheaded just thinking about that. Number one, 
Kalima, Kalima. I saved the best part for last, and despite all the knowledge and beautiful things the Aztecs should be known for, they are perhaps most remembered for their human sacrifices. The Aztecs loved to sacrifice anything to the gods, honestly, and in one count, an estimated 80,000 sacrifices in four days. Is that something to boast about? I'm not sure. Taking the beating heart out of a person while still alive in front of roaring crowds, is that evil or is that theater? I don't know. Sadly for the people on the operating table and those watching the sacrifices did not seem to have much effect when Europeans came over and destroyed their cities. Maybe if we sacrifice harder, then we shall beat our enemies. Yeah, I don't know, but that's along the same thought process, I guess. I went into the chief's tent last night, and you know what? He said that's not it. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go, go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nets? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it, that's actually it. Yeah, we like that, that's it. Number nine, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angie. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious as you know that DEFCON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom or be late for your event or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could use some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals, and not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts. Remember that guy? 
This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and Vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyed their teeth distinct colors, so then you'd know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas. I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. It's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works part two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before, and it's coming from your armpit. Puberty-induced body odor. Not to worry. Your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with the hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh, too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were giving out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. 
It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. At number 10, human sacrifice. If you know anything about Aztec civilization, then you're probably familiar with their sacrificial practices. Human sacrifice was a huge part of Aztec culture, and there are a number of theories to explain why these rituals were so important and happened so frequently. It is believed that the Aztecs practiced human sacrifice as a way to repay their debts to the gods, or as a display of political power. It really just depended on who was being sacrificed, which is honestly a little bit scary when you think about it. These rituals were a big deal to the community. It would involve a large gathering of people at the sacrificial temple. A priest would stand at the top of the temple with the person being sacrificed, and they would use a ceremonial knife to make an incision along the abdomen, reach inside, and pull out the person's heart while it was still beating. They would then place the heart in a bowl and then push the person down the temple stairs. What makes this more intense is the fact that those in attendance would also hurt themselves as part of an auto-sacrificial ritual. Imagining all of this happening at once is quite mysterious and a little scary if I'm being honest. At number 9, Capture. Usually in warfare, especially in ancient times, the goal was to eliminate your enemies, so to speak. You go out there and you get rid of the threat. For ancient civilizations like the Greeks and the Romans, the amount of kills that you had determined your success as a warrior, but things were different for the Aztecs because they didn't rate your skill as a warrior on how many kills you had, but rather how many captures. It is believed that the Aztecs didn't want to kill their enemies on the battlefield, and that doing so was actually very clumsy. Instead, they believed that capturing your enemy alive showed more skill on the battlefield. This is a very different practice than most other ancient civilizations because most of them were all about blood shed and gore. Now you might be wondering why they preferred to capture their enemies and not eliminate them on the battlefield, and that's because they needed more people for sacrifices, point blank period. They didn't want to use their own people, so they used as many outsiders as they could, and battlefields were the perfect place to find new sacrifices. So capturing their opponents was just a win-win for them. Now before I carry on with the rest of these mysterious facts, let me first take a moment to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even subscribe to the channel if this type of content is really up your alley and you would like to see more of this. At number 8, Psychological Warfare Other than their practices of capturing their enemy on the battlefield, the Aztecs also had other methods of taking down their opponents, and that was through psychological warfare. Within the Aztec army, there were different ranks called Jaguars and Eagles, and these warriors, when in battle, wore outfits to make them look like their namesakes, either Jaguars or Eagles. The eagles wore feathers and wore wooden helmets that made it look like the warrior's face was coming out of an eagle, and the jaguars wore the skin of a jaguar and wooden helmets that looked like the animal as well. While in battle, it is believed that these outfits were used for psychological warfare to confuse their enemy and frighten them away with these agile animalistic warriors. And if their outfits and agility weren't enough to scare them off, it is said that the other Aztec warriors would also bang on drums and make a lot of noise to scare off their opponents. At number 7, Insane Weapons The Aztecs were some bloodthirsty people, as you could imagine. I mean, unaliving people was part of their everyday practice, so you could imagine that they would have come up with some pretty brutal weapons to take down their enemies, right? Well, let me tell you about one gnarly weapon that the Aztecs called Hungry Wood because of how bloodthirsty this thing was. Because the Aztecs never developed metal tools, they had to improvise to make their deadly weapons, and they used what was available to them. To make the Hungry Wood weapon, they used a wooden plank, and they embedded shards of obsidian into it, and this thing was super sharp. Apparently, it was powerful enough to take someone's head off, and honestly, I wouldn't second guess that. According to a report from Spaniards who encountered the Aztecs, they once saw a warrior use this weapon to take the head off a horse in one blow. This was even tested in real life, and though it took more like three solid blows to achieve the same outcome, the fact that this ancient tool was powerful enough to do that says a lot about this civilization. At number six, 
different afterlife. In many different cultures, they have varying stories of what happens to you after you pass away. There seems to be a common theme of a quote unquote good place and a quote unquote bad place, but with the Aztecs, they were really doing something different with their stories of the afterlife, and it all depended on how you died. In Aztec beliefs, if you died as a warrior, then your soul would go on to somewhere that involved more war and you would battle there for four years before returning to the earth as a hummingbird. For women who died during childbirth, their afterlife involved them helping the sun prepare to rise and fall. For those who died of some kind of sickness, they went to an afterlife that had an abundance of food. And for those who simply died of old age, then they went through a trial and their souls had four years to pass through eight levels of challenges, some of which included climbing an obsidian mountain and passing through an area of beasts who eat human hearts. And if they made it to the ninth level, then they would finally find peace. Their afterlife was incredibly complex and did not sound at all restful. At number five, harsh truth. Life is hard. No one really tells you that when you're a kid. Well, at least not these days. Back during the reign of the Aztec civilization, kids were taught from day one that life was not going to be easy for them. From the moment a baby was born, they were told that life was pain, you know, so that they knew exactly what they were getting themselves into. In Aztec culture, as soon as a baby was born, the midwife would take the baby in their arms and tell them the truth about life. They would look the newborn in the eyes as part of their religious tradition and tell the child, quote, life is an affliction, end quote. To really make the point of how tough that kid's life is gonna be, the midwife also promised the child that they would, quote, die a horrible and violent death, either in war or as human sacrifice, end quote. Sounds like quite the life. At number four, stretch the kids. We all know that over time we grow, right? It's just a fact of life. We start off as little babies and we grow into big adults and whatnot. Well, the Aztecs kind of knew this, but didn't quite understand the whole concept of growth. They knew that people grew, but they thought that it was a manual thing and that they had to stretch their kids by hand to make sure that they grew to be big and tall. And no, I'm not making this up. They actually stretched their kids. In their culture, Aztec parents would hold ceremonies called the stretching of people to make them grow. I know, catchy name, right? During this stretching ceremony, they would take the kid by the neck and just dangle them in the air, letting gravity do its thing, and then they would move on to pulling on their arms and legs to stretch them out a bit to make sure that every part grew evenly. I have no idea where this thought to stretch their kids came from, but I do know that Aztecs were obsessed with making sure that their kids grew tall. So I mean, if pulling a stretch Armstrong on little Timmy helped him grow an extra inch, then to each their own, I guess. At number three, discipline. This is probably one of the wildest forms of discipline I have ever heard of, and I would not recommend that you try this on your own kids because this is absolutely brutal, but then again, the Aztecs were some pretty brutal people, so it's only fitting that they start off at a young age. Aztec parents did not take any kind of lip from their kids. No one was misbehaving on their watch. Now, the disciplinary actions that the kids received varied depending on their age. If they were under the age of 11, then the naughty children would be poked with spines from a cactus, and if they were really bad, then they would be covered in those spines. But for kids over the age of 11, their punishments for being lazy or misbehaving were so much worse than being poked with cactus spines. Instead, they would hold their kid over burning chili peppers in a fireplace, making them breathe in the fumes. This was a very harsh punishment, but that was the life of an Aztec. Harsh from the get-go. At number two, mandatory dance party. Another pretty odd thing that the Aztecs did was they held mandatory late night dance parties. Yeah, they basically had raves that everyone had to attend. This all night dance party was essentially the only way that young Aztec boys and girls could socialize because apart from these social gatherings, they were separated at school. These dance parties gave them a chance to socialize and also learn about their culture as it gave the adults an opportunity to share stories with the youngest generation of Aztecs. They would spend the whole night learning about religion and philosophy through songs played at the dance party. And the young Aztecs would also learn to flirt with one another since it was their only opportunity to. I think that out of all of the weird facts about Aztec culture, this is actually pretty cool because I've never heard of a culture having mandatory dance parties before. That's actually pretty awesome. And finally, at number one, skull racks. Now moving on from something groovy to something rather spooky, we have Aztec skull racks. If you were to visit large city centers and temples at the height of the Aztec civilization, then you would have been greeted by a rather scary sight. 
racks upon racks of human skulls estimated to be as large as 200 feet long and 100 feet wide. These racks featured the skulls of thousands of sacrificial victims. These racks were there to honor the gods to whom these victims had been sacrificed, as well as to demonstrate the city's power. I'm sure that if you walked into a big city and saw thousands of skulls lined up like that, you would be a little afraid too, right? The Spanish conquistadors were certainly frightened the first time they set eyes on the skull racks, and they documented every frightening emotion, making sure that we all knew just how frightening the Aztecs really were. 